Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first of a series of national held with Australia's new Climate Commission. May we uh, welcome the commissioners and I'll briefly introduce them to you. From your left, Chief Commissioner, internationally acclaimed scientist, writer, conservationist and former Australian of the Year, Professor Tim Flannery. Uh, thank you. Adjacent to Tim, Mr Jerry Houston, recently retired President of BP Australia. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Professor Leslie Hughes, Head of the Department of Biological Sciences at Macquarie University. <laughs> Professor Will Steffen, Executive Director of the Australian National University Climate Change Institute. And Mr. Roger Beale, Executive Director of Economics and Policy at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Flannery will introduce the Commissioners more a little later. I'd also like to acknowledge that our forum is being held on the traditional lands of the Wadawurrung people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I'd also like to pay, pay my respects to their elders, past and present, present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. You're welcome to do that too. For those who don't know me or think that my only task in my life has ever been to do the weather on the telly, my name is Rob Gell. I'm an environmentalist and earth scientist, a practicing environmental communications consultant. I'm also the National President of Greening Australia, member of the Victorian Coastal Council. I chair a UNESCO biosphere on the other side of Port Phillip Bay, and I'm a member of, Victoria's, of the Victorian Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability's reference group, so I hope I'll be able to faithfully facilitate this evening's discussions. <laughs> a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will be recorded uh, for live broadcast and publicly available on the website. I think that's a very good thing to do. So if you would prefer not to be digitally recorded or photographed, there's an area that you should move to, and I believe that uh, you've been asked about that as you came in. Uh, I just want to remind people about that. Also, if you have a question to ask, you will be asked to sign a release form so that we can continue to use your image. So just be aware of that as well. Now, because the Commission values your feedback, there are certainly some feedback forms on your seats. And it's very important that you fill these in and uh, pass these back at the conclusion of the event. Exits, there's the exit that you came in from. Uh, there's another exit hidden behind over here and some more on the south side of the building. Uh, in a case of an emergency, you'll be directed to one of those exits. Toilets are at the back of the room. And may I ask you please to make sure that your mobile phone won't ring I understand how precious they are to you, so at least have it on vibrate or whatever is your preference, but please don't let it ring in, in fairness to the question, uh, uh, questions being asked by our commissioners. The aim of this evening is to begin a conversation. I think that's a legitimate word to use. The commission is here to listen as well as to share its knowledge and experiences. We'll hear from each commissioner on what they've heard from people in Geelong. They've been out and about today. We'll also hear from some of the Geelong community on their climate change concerns. We have had a large number of questions submitted as you registered for uh, and we'll here put those into two categories. Certainly we'll look at uh, science but also look at carbon pricing as a key issue as well. But initially Commissioner Flannery has asked that we do that. I do request though that your questions be focused and as brief as possible so that we can have an opportunity for as many people as possible to participate actively. So if you're making statements, I'm afraid I will cut you off and I'll take them as comments or statements so that we can move on to legitimate questions. The question is conducted politely and with a high level of mutual respect. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Professor Tim Flannery as the Chief Climate Commissioner, uh, of course, I've mentioned already he's one of the writers on climate change internationally acclaimed scientist. He works around the world, uh, explorer, conservationist, and named Australian of the Year in 2007. He's held various academic positions, including professor at the University of Adelaide, director of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, 
Principal Research Scientist at the Australian Museum and Visiting Chair in Australian Studies at Harvard University in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. Please welcome Tim, Tim Flannery. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you all for coming out on this rather chilly Geelong evening. Uh, I must admit that with the Cats game on in Melbourne, I thought we might be looking at uh, two people and a dog or something like that, so I'm very, very pleased to see such a large group of people interested in this subject. I just want to br briefly explain to you about the Commission's role and our intent being here tonight. This is our first event, and we came to Geelong, we wanted to come to Geelong specifically because we felt that in areas like this, it, the cl climate change and the community and government response to the issue are critically important to your futures. You have many industries down here that are trade exposed, that are carbon intensive. You're also in an area that's being affected by climate change. So it's important that we as an Australian, as a nation, get the response to climate change right, particularly for places like Geelong. The Commission is an independent body. Um, we don't take um, advice, we don't uh, uh, take direction from the Minister or from the Government. And I value our, com our independence um, particularly, as do all of the Commissioners. Um, I've criticised um, John Howard and Kevin Rudd on climate policy and I value my independence in that area and my distance from politics. Um, uh, greatly and I want to carry that into the Commission's role and I think it's very important that we remain independent otherwise why would people listen to us we could just be giving you political spin and that I'm determined not to do. We really want to foster a, a deeper community discussion about climate science, about the international environment that, that Australia is uh, acting uh, in and on the options, the economic options, that are before us uh, as a nation. It's a genuine two-way dialogue. Um, this morning we were at the Shell Refinery here in Geelong and it was a fantastic experience for me to see that extraordinary thing down there. It's an amazing industrial complex. Uh, and to hear firsthand um, from uh, workers down there about their concerns uh, and about the structure and nature of their business. Over lunch today, we had a fantastic community lunch. Your federal representative uh, for North Geelong turned up along with um, a number of state representatives and three mayors from the district and business leaders. We had, a, a, I think, a really constructive and, and deep engagement over that lunch. And so we come somewhat armed this evening with a sense of the, challenge, the challenges and opportunities that present themselves uh, in this region. I'm going to be very, very brief because I really want to hear from you. Um, just to reassure you that we'll get you home by 7.30, by the time that the Cats game uh, is due to start. So don't worry about that. Don't panic and run out at the end. Um, we're going to stick to our schedule. Um, once again, thank you very much for coming and we look forward to, uh, to a very lively couple of hours. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We now have for you, just to begin proceedings, three brief presentations from members of the, Ge of the Geelong community. First, we have with us students from the Geelong Students Environmental Network. I'll ask them to stand up and reveal themselves to you. And their spokesperson, Tycho Wharton from Cadenia College, will say a few words. Welcome, Tycho. The Geelong Students Environment Network is a student network promoting collaboration on the topic of the environment and sustainability between different schools in Geelong. To date, we have, pr we have pr promoted collaboration between schools and shared ideas from the installation of solar panels to implementing better recycling systems, as well as how positive interaction between schools can lead to the community as a whole making a positive change. We're very grateful to have the opportunity today to represent the opinions of many students. We believe that it is important for these discussions to be had with all members of the community and should be promoted to a greater extent within schools. Young people 
have an important perspective that should be taken into consideration when forming a policy that will define our future. As a group, we believe that it is vital that action be taken on the issue of climate change. Thus, we are very pleased that the government is taking the step of starting this discussion, of engaging with communities to develop the best possible solutions. We understand that this is a difficult debate. There will be many hard choices, many different viewpoints. But I'd just like you to know that we as young people are doing everything we can through all available channels to look for solutions. However, action from our leaders and communities is needed to secure a safe future for our climate. We hope we have shown you that young people have an important opinion on this issue. And this is not simply about numbers, models and impact statements. This is about our future. We can act in our local environment, but lasting change needs the support of government across Australia and across the world. We hope that this is the first of many productive sessions for the Climate Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Tycho. The second local representative is Councillor John Dool. Councillor Dool is a qualified pilot and flying instructor who also studied building and project management at RMIT and worked in architecture in Melbourne. His hobbies include bushwalking, flying in outback Australia, which you would do, I suppose, if you did that, uh, alternative Australian music, art house films, theatre and collecting books. He was elected to the City of Greater Geelong Council in November 2008. Councillor Dool holds the portfolio for climate change and environment and sustainability. Please welcome Councillor Dool. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on which we meet, uh, the Wathurong, and may I pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, can I also acknowledge the uh, Climate Commission, um, Professor Tim Flannery, Professor Will Steffen, Professor Leslie Hughes, J Mr Jerry Houston and Mr Roger Beale. And I'd also like to acknowledge fellow councillors, councillors Andy Richard, uh, Richard Stretch Contell and Barbara Abley. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the Climate Commission to Geelong and we are delighted as a council that uh, Geelong has been chosen to be the first stop on a national tour. As you're aware, Geelong is a key manufacturing region. It accounts for close to half of all the revenue generated by businesses in the Geelong, in the Barwon region, a total of $13.8 billion. We are home to Alcoa, Ford, Borrell, Godfrey Hearst, Shell, Blue Circle Cement and other major manufacturing companies. Our region's continued prosperity depends on these industries and others being able to transition to a low-carbon future without losing jobs for our people. Council, together with our major companies, are committed to reducing our carbon footprint. As an organisation, we have developed a number of greenhouse responses, which has resulted in a considerable reduction of our carbon emissions. Ambitious targets for councils are being met through conversion to green energy technology, such as solar panels, cogeneration, hybrid cars and wind turbines, as well as major water saving initiatives. We also have Eco Challenge which is a cross-organisational program for reducing greenhouse emissions across various council departments. In 2009, council embarked on a climate change adaptation strategy, which is one of the first for local governments in the state. This strategy, now completed, has assisted council in identifying the risks associated with climate change. Implementing the strategy will build resilience internally and within the broader community. The climate change adaptation strategy is about having a framework for council to manage climate change risks and maximise opportunities into the future. Climate change will continue to present a variety of risks to council that need to be identified, evaluated and prioritised. A climate change adaptation strategy allows council to better use current resources and provides council with a better understanding for the future resourcing planning and therefore council will be better able to adjust to climate change impacts. Along with the non-government organisation ICLEI, who supports local governments around the world to reduce their greenhouse emissions, I attended the International Climate Change Conference COP15 at Copenhagen in Denmark in 2009. This was, a political, this was in a political capacity to assist ICLEI in lobbying for local government and sub-national governments to be included in the text of any international binding agreements. Last year we launched a very important pilot program, which I'm very proud of, Future Proofing Geelong 
which seeks to position Geelong as a demonstration city, showcasing our capacity to transition to a low carbon future while continuing to develop existing industry, grow our economy and support our city's livability. As part of Future Proofing Geelong, we're about to launch a low carbon growth plan in late April, which will be an Australian first. This pro the program, uh, program's research identifies actions to reduce our region's emissions and highlights opportunities to collaborate with government, local industry and the community to transition to a low carbon economy. And can I acknowledge the, the partners, Sustainability Victoria, Department of uh, Sustainability Environment and the EPA, and the cooperation of Committee for Geelong, Bar and Water, G21 and major industries within Geelong. As you can see, we acknowledge the reality of climate change and a great deal of work, in, including research and planning, has been done in collaboration with others to identify opportunities to reduce our greenhouse emissions. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss how price on carbon will be implemented and the effects this will have out on our local economy. We acknowledge the need for Australia to act to reduce global emissions, but again, any action must be considered with the competitiveness of our local businesses. In 2008, our Mayor led a delegation to Canberra, which I attended, representing the most impacted industrial communities within Australia, including Geelong, Central Queensland, Illawarra, Portland and Tasmania. The delegation called on the government and the opposition to introduce a policy that would help reduce global emissions without driving Australian industry and investment offshore. I wish to thank the opportunity to present on behalf of the City of Greater Geelong tonight and thank you again for visiting Geelong and giving our community this opportunity to have a say and be involved in addressing the uh, very important issue of climate change reality. Thank you, Councillor. I meant to, we have one more presentation to come, but I meant to ask the Commissioner or Commissioners whether you had any response to either Tycho's presentation or to John's just now. Do you want to make a comment at this stage? Take an opportunity or not? We move on. Perhaps we should move, move on. Move on. Thank you. Uh, our final presentation is from Wayne Klempel. Wayne is a resident of Geelong, works in Melbourne. He's a member of the Socialist Alliance. Welcome, welcome to Wayne. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what are we here for tonight? Discuss um, building of a, some elaborate sort of merry-go-round, or are we here to build a carbon-free future for generations unseen? There's not a great deal of sense building um, some sort of elaborate merry-go-round. We really should be focused on carbon-free future, and that's how I see the carbon tax. Do we take Peter and give? Do we take from Peter and give money to Paul? and Paul gives money to Mary, Bob and Jane, who eventually gives it back to Peter in some way or other. This is how I'd see the carbon tax. Taxing the big polluters, you pass the cost on to the consumer and then the government gives three billion, and then the government gives 13 billion subsidies back to the polluters again. This won't work. What we do need is to, then is to actually fix the problem. We need to stop companies polluting the atmosphere through regulation and not by bringing in a merry-go-round tax. The governments need to stop paying companies to pollute, abolish $13 million subsidies in fossil fuel tax to, to all um, fossil companies who, who, who burn fossil fuel. <coughs> a Victorian branch of the Beyond Zero Emissions, um, it's an organisation in Melbourne, has demonstrated that it would be possible to connect to convert the economy to 100% carbon free in 10 years, base, base power um, included. And according to zero emissions, that is, that is possible. The government needs to find, the, the government needs to fund the transition. At, and the most important infrastructure was initially built by the government and it needs to be, it needs to happen again to guarantee renewable energy. We need to make changes in the way we live and work. We do, uh, do more regarding energy conservation, shift funding from roads to massive expansion in public transport and rail freight. We have known about climate change for more than 20 odd years and our politicians still have done nothing. 
We need to make changes to the system we operate under. God knows privatisation doesn't work. Governments need to stop fiddling with the market to cut emissions and actually set scientifically based targets. Persuade other countries to follow our lead. How can we pay for all this? Money our government uh, wastes daily, on a daily basis through, uh, is astronomical. Billions of dollars are spent on wars and that could be spent on funding renewable energy instead. The mining companies are making megabucks from the mining boom as well. So Tim, tell Julia, Bob and Tony if he will listen. Um, we don't need a carbon tax or a big plan to do nothing. We need to start building a new way to live and a new future for now and today. So let's leave future generations a bright, clean, green future to play in, not a backyard full of useless toys. I'm sure they'll thank you for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
are copying the effects of that, those, that pollution continuously. And I want you to specifically take uh, the question back of do not believe industry's consistent argument that it continuously costs jobs if a carbon price is bought in because we ask you to challenge that because our position for the last 10 years is, is not always true. I think we might have an opportunity to hear from each of the commissioners on that question, <laughs> Tim, certainly Jerry and Roger. Uh, we begin with perhaps Roger, do you have an initial, initial well, response? Um, <coughs> First of all, a price drives and supports the sorts of things that you want to do. As so far as the major industries are concerned, with, with pollution that is non-carbon pollution, we have mechanisms to deal with that. So far as carbon pollution is concerned, we need to give signals that enable them to have the investment that cleans and clarifies their production, that gives them confidence for the future, but which also sensibly protects us from acting in a way that leads to carbon leakage to other parts of the world. So it's a balancing act uh, through this transition period. All the schemes that have been suggested so far have involved some form of uh, protection for the emissions intensive trade exposed sector as the world moves to, to price carbon more consistently uh, among our trading partners. I have, but I'd ask you to be wary of those like the EPA's EREP, which deals with that and does, has very, very little effect, we would argue. Yeah, so you're separating the sort of local pollution issues that you might anticipate that the watchdog EPA might control as opposed to the broader issues around a carbon price as well? Yes, because those, those um, time-consuming um, changes are at this stage being monitored by the EPA. The first part might be something you might need to take up with a new Premier. Mm. Probably. Let's have another question, if we may. Uh, can we go right down the back? There's a lady sitting on the aisle in the mauve, to I think, top. My name's Renata Nelson and I'm just a citizen. Speak up, if you would. My name's Renata Nelson and I'm just a citizen and I'd like to ask Tim Flannery. Oops. Could, Tim, could you please tell us that we're a carbon tax and an or an emission trading scheme adopted globally today, by how much and by when would the Earth's temperature be reduced? Good question. Thank you, Renata. Look, I'll, I'll begin to answer that question and then hand over to Will Stefan, if I could, who's our real expert in this area. Um, my understanding of the science is that if, if all carbon emissions were stopped tomorrow, um, it would take several centuries or up to a thousand years for the temperature, the carbon dioxide levels and the temperatures to start falling appreciably. So we're committed to a certain amount of warming already by the gases that are in the air. And they don't come out very quickly. It takes a long time for that, those excess gases to be absorbed by the Earth's system. So the answer to the question is, even if everyone stopped, we're not going to, to get a reduction in temperature or, or emissions for some time after we do that. The other side of the coin, though, is what happens if we don't stop? And if we don't stop putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the warming trend will continue. And we, we uh, then are threatened with the possibility of triggering a change that we can't control, even if we stop emitting greenhouse gases, because there's a number of positive feedback loops, as they're called in the Earth system, that may take over. But Will may be in a better position to, to discuss that than myself. Yeah, just a couple, couple of comments and put some numbers behind that. Um, the challenge we face is to keep our budget of emissions uh, toward the middle of this century down to something on order of 700 billion tonnes of CO2. It sounds like a lot, but just to give you an idea, over the last decade, the world has emitted 300 billion tonnes. So if we could emit about two and a half times that and then limit it to that, we would ke keep the temperature to about two degrees above pre-industrial. This would peak out in the second half of the century uh, and stabilize around 2100 and then slowly relax. Some of the longer term uh, phenomena that Tim referred to are things like the big ice sheets, uh, which behave on much longer time frames. It would take longer for them to stabilize. Uh, but the point is our target is to stabilize the climate at no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial and the associated changes uh, that go along with that 
that have various time scales. But we could stabilize temperature uh, in the second half of this century if we really cut emissions down by mid-century. Uh, Will, just before you go on, could you just give us a, just a very quick um, explanation of, the, of, of what causes climate change in the long term and in, and in the shorter term, just so we've got a bit of an introduction to the, to the science. Okay, well we start with the long term uh, and look at the uh, cycles of ice ages and warm periods. And we've been about 12,000 years in a warm period. That's a period in which agriculture was first developed, cities, towns, civilizations, and so on. That cycling between ice ages and warm periods is paced by the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, but the actual change in, in, in sunlight that comes in is very small compared to the big swings between ice ages and warm periods. Two things drive those swings. One are greenhouse gases, of which carbon dioxide is the most important, and the second is the ice ages waxing and waning. We are in a long, uh, warm period of very stable climate, so we would not expect to see any appreciable change in climate over the next 10,000 years in the future. What we're seeing now is just as sometimes nature puts more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the Earth warms. If humans do the same thing, it's a no-brainer. The Earth will warm, and that's exactly what we see. So what we're now doing is moving uh, above that very long, stable period of climate uh, that we expect to last for about 20 or 30,000 years. And we know the cause very, very well. This, ca this cause that we see now is not natural variability. We know very well the uh, various types of natural variability, and what we're seeing now uh, is uh, a response to the additional greenhouse gas, gases that have come into the atmosphere uh, after the Industrial Revolution. Thanks, Will. Another question. Gentleman here on... There's a gentleman sitting down I'll take first, if I may. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Phil. Uh, I'm a member of the local sustainability group. Uh, I understand that about 40% of Victoria's uh, carbon emissions come from the production of aluminium, mainly here in Geelong and at Portland. And I also understand that about half the production of aluminium uh, is exported as, as ingots. The other half is uh, rolled into thin sheet to make beverage containers for beer and soft drinks. My question is, uh, how will the carbon tax um, influence a change from, say, the production of beer cans, which you could argue are not that useful to society, to thin film to produce solar panels and other sustainable products? And what's in the way for Alcoa to bring in a, um, uh, a deposit scheme so that aluminium cans can be recycled so that's my question. A couple of questions Sorry, there, actually, Tim. I'm wondering whether you might let Jerry have a go at that. Actually, Rob, can I just add one more thing to that? I have seen a study which suggests that um, Alcoa's aluminium plant here in Geelong, being one of the oldest in the world, is also one of the least efficient, dirtiest, most polluting uh, aluminium plants in the world. And that actually, if there was leakage, of that production overseas, that that would actually be a good thing because that would go possibly to a more efficient, cleaner, less polluting planet. I think the commissioners have got the gist of the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think that's um, you know, the sort of question that I think you should be, you know, in, in terms of the detail, um, you know, addressing to the Alcoas of this world, because you know I, I've seen um, summaries of work which have suggested that this plant, um, you know, on a, on a level playing field, is is competitive in terms of its energy use with uh, with plants around the world, and that's 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 what will define the future of the the plant in the long term. Um, but you know, mention has been made also of of um, of, of the the you know, the short term impact and the transition period. As to whether you know that plant should be um, you know, disadvantaged versus potential competitors overseas that didn't have a t carbon tax on them, and you know I, as, as Roger said, that's been recognised as a legitimate concern for trade-exposed industries. In, in terms of the in terms of the output of the plant and the products that are produced, um, ultimately, um, 
you know, that's, that's, that, that gets driven by um, probably the global price of aluminium products and their carbon content and, and, and the way that consumers respond to that. So ultimately it's going to be consumers that will determine the sorts of things that the manufacturing companies make. Um, you know, consumers will dictate that. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and they will make their judgments based on the usefulness of the products. Um, uh, other competitors that come in and uh, that, that they find more appealing uh, and you know, part of the con consideration in the future will be you know, the, the, you know, the amount of impost that there is because of high energy use in the, uh, in, in the, in the manufacture of those products. But you know, it's, it's not something that, uh, uh, unless you had a government edict, uh, that would change it overnight. Thank you. Uh, I'll come to you. There's a lady in the front here I'd like to take. I'd like to hear a question. I want to hear a question that sort of talks about uh, the impact of climate change on, on uh, biodiversity or our, um, the, the living bits and pieces. I want to direct to Leslie in a moment, if I may. So I think one up. Um, this is a very practical question and very Let us simple. know who you are first, please. Pardon? You, you, is it explain to the audience who you are, oh, please. I'm Val Nichols, and I used to live and work in Geelong. I have now moved to country Victoria. And in my part of country Victoria, in 1995, I installed solar power. And I can only use 10 volt from my solar power system because otherwise I need to use a qualified electrician. When I wanted to increase from 10 volt to 240 volt, they, I rang the electricity company and they sent someone out who looked at my land, but nothing has happened since. Yeah. And I would like to ask the panel what the connection is, is with commercial organisations who currently provide the electricity when you want to convert your solar system. Okay. I don't know whether we've got any electricians here. There might be one in the audience. But who wants to have a go? Tim? I think it's you. It, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I can speak with a little bit of personal experience because I live in a house with standalone solar. So we don't have any mains connection. We only run on solar. And we had to upgrade from a 12 volt system to a 240 volt system. We had to buy an inverter to do that. And that costs, I, I think the costs were around about $1,000. And then that inverter would do that for you. So it's, it's, it's something within the, it, it's an investment you have to make effectively. Um, and you may get a, a smaller and cheaper inverter if you've got a small system. Thank you. Gentleman here. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Dawson. I've uh, been a consultant in the environment, energy and water industries for about 20 years. Um, I think one of the, the problems the public has is, is grappling with the science. The communication of the science is not clear. So my suggestion and my question really is um, if each of the commissioners here tonight could cite the particular uh, reputably published peer-reviewed empirical science uh, clearly demonstrating that human carbon dioxide emissions are the major cause of any dangerous global warming it would give a lot of people some comfort and um, by empirical science I don't mean models unfortunately uh, I'm gonna let Leslie have a go at this because of the made there's some stuff in her field um, sure the, there's it's really easy to understand why people are confused and that's part of the reason we're doing this because there's an awful lot of information out there and it's really hard to tell unless um, you've got scientific background what's good and what isn't. Um, there has been some recent um, publications put out there. Um, one of the most recent and I think one of the best is from the, Acad the Australian Academy of Sciences and if anybody wants a really um, fairly easy to read, up-to-date, pithy um, document about climate change and its causes. Simply Google Australian Academy of Sciences and it will get you there. And I can't think of really a better short document. Um, eventually when our Commission website is up and running a bit better, um, we will be linking to that and all sorts of other credible sources of information. Those papers demonstrate the link between human carbon dioxide emissions and any global warming. Okay, the, the, the first thing you have to do is just say carbon dioxide and temperature change, whether the carbon dioxide comes from natural emissions or human. Uh, that's the real science. That's been known since about 1850. 
the first peer-reviewed published paper on that was done by John Tyndall uh, well over 150 years ago uh, when he actually irradiated carbon dioxide with exactly the same wavelength of radiation of heat coming out from the Earth's surface. And lo and behold, it did uh, absorb that radiation uh, just as we thought. Uh, there have been hundreds of peer-reviewed uh, papers since then uh, which uh, support that, that theory. Now, the evidence we have now, and this has nothing to do with models, are so-called fingerprints. Uh, the patterns of warming that you see differ whether it's solar radiation or whether it's carbon dioxide, because we know where carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. We know the properties because we measure them in the laboratory, peer-reviewed literature. We know the radiation coming out of the Earth's surface. Again, we measure that very carefully. And patterns such as nighttime uh, low temperatures are rising more than daytime high temperatures. That's typical of greenhouse gas forcing the climate rather than sun. The fact that the upper atmosphere above the greenhouse gases is cooling and the atmosphere below is warming, again, is a fingerprint. So there are a number of these fingerprints, again, observed, put in the peer-reviewed literature, uh, fits with the physics and so on. I could go on and on, but I would uh, urge you to look at working group one of the IPCC report and go through the reference list. Go through the reference list on all the peer-reviewed papers. And Tim, you'd like to make a comment too? I would just briefly, in terms of the greenhouse gases and their impact on warming the planet, one of the best demonstrations you can have is just considering the moon. The moon is about the same distance from the sun as the Earth is, yet its surface temperature is minus 15 degrees, which is just what the Earth would be if there were no greenhouse gases. So there you've got a really good example of how greenhouse gases bring our temperature up 30 degrees Celsius, up to plus 15. And knowing that, um, as greenhouse gases concentrations increase, and we can measure the increasing temperature of the planet, it's all very consistent. Could I say about models as well, while we're, while we're on them, put three pieces of data together and you've got a model. We use models all the time for all sorts of things. We don't ever expect that they'll tell us the, the truth or predict the future, but they are a very, very good guide in a probabilistic sense to how large complex systems work. And we couldn't, we couldn't live without them in, in innumerable aspects of our lives. Why people are fixated on the climate models as particularly somehow un, untrustworthy is just... It, Give us I an example, Tim. Where else do we use models? Oh, we use modelling in, well, petroleum exploration would be a great example. There's pro medical, medical imaging and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it's, I, you, my fellow scientists could probably pick some other examples that are, that are in more everyday use. Yeah. Yeah. Aircraft design. Every time you fly on an airplane, modern airplane, they've been designed by models of how the atmosphere works and how objects fly through it. Uh, and yet we, we trust the engineers, we trust the scientists who design those. Uh, and they're far safer than driving a motor car, for example. Presumably we have models of nuclear reactors too. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We have, models of, we have models of weather systems, the weather predictions, the same sort of models, you know, in a small sense that are used for climate prediction and so forth. So, um, it's not like models are something which are unique to the climate system or unfamiliar in terms of uh, many human enterprises. It's, it's the way you use them, it's important. There's one on the far side there. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Let us Rob. know who you are. My name's Tom O'Connor from the Committee for Bellarine. Food, Tim, food, energy and water security. How do, we, how do we build that into the equation? You know, we can talk about the science, and I must admit it, it you know, goes over the head. How do we build that into the equation? You know, that, that really is, I guess, the outcome of it all. Yeah, how does it affect... And, Rob, this is probably a question addressed to your good self. How are they built in? Food security, water security and energy security, whether we've got an abundance or a shortage, it doesn't really matter. But they're the... You know, they're the that, that predicates the survival of humanity. You won't mind if I direct it to the Commission, will you? Yes. <laughs> I think... Do you want to take up, Tim? Yeah. Could, could I just briefly... I mean, we're getting a little bit outside the remit of the Commission now with these, with these areas, but I just want to briefly comment that today we went and had a look at the Shell plant, uh, the Shell uh, uh, petroleum uh, plant, and that was very interesting because the engineers that run that said that, you know, a decade or two ago, if one part of the plant had broken down, they would have been able to continue on using the other plants and so produce their product. Um, but today it's also tightly integrated that the breakdown in one part of the plant affects the whole thing. And I thought, that's really an analogy almost for the human species as we're evolving now. We're becoming so tightly interwoven and so tightly interdependent that a breakdown anywhere in the system has repercussions through the whole system. So when we consider food and water security and energy security now, these, these are big global issues that need to be dealt with. I don't think anyone's got any, any clear answers yet as to, as to how we can manage 
the fragility of the system that we're building. Leslie? Could I just add a little bit to, to that about my particular area that, I, uh, that I've done some research on? And that is one of, one of the things that a lot of times people ask us questions and they say, but surely CO2, for example, is good, good for plants and therefore good for food. And that's actually true. CO2 is a, a fundamental thing that plants use to photosynthesize and produce our food, and it's the basis of our food chain. What people often, what most people don't realise though, is when you when you grow a plant at, at higher CO2, and CO2 is is appreciably being measured at higher and higher levels, um, they do grow faster, they grow bigger, they actually though become less nutritious because as they get bigger and grow faster, they take up less nitrogen proportionately to the amount of carbon in the tissues. And nitrogen is what you use, plants use to build protein. So as plants grow at higher and higher CO2, they actually become less nutritious in terms of protein. So apart from, you know, CO2 will have an impact on our food security via its impacts on climate. CO2 will also have a direct impact on the quality of the food we eat. And whilst you're there, Leslie, what about other ecosystems? Um, yeah, I've been researching the impacts of climate change on ecosystems and species for about the last 20 years. And one of the things that we're most concerned about is the impact of climate change on natural systems because they've got probably the least ability to adapt quickly enough. Um, species do evolve, um, but they evolve very slowly. It takes about a million years to make a new species and we don't have that long for most species to adjust. So uh, it's the IPCC estimated that with about um, two to three degrees above pre-industrial levels of warming, we may be committing um, between about 30 and 50% of global biodiversity to an increased risk of extinction. Now, we're, we're already at nearly a degree towards that um, goal, if you like to call it a goal. Um, so we're, we're very concerned. And places like the Great Barrier Reef, places like our Alpine region, Kakadu National Park, they will be the first to suffer really major changes. And we're already seeing species responding very, very sensitively to climate change. Examples? Well, for example, what we would expect is as the climate zones shift, we expect species that can move, you know, they can swim or fly, to move with the climate zones, to stay in their preferred climate zone that they're in now. And what we're actually seeing is a lot of species doing that. So in Australia, we're seeing species like birds move, uh, move further and further south. We're seeing lots of marine species move south. We're seeing species move up mountains. We're, we're seeing lots of differences in their, the timing of life cycles compared to, you know, spring is being sprung much earlier than it used to be. Um, so we know that even with um, fractions of degree of warming per decade, the natural ecosystems are responding very, very sensitively. Thank you. Gentlemen sorry, here. Sorry, Rob. Sorry, sorry, Jerry. Um, just, just to pick up a little bit on the, the energy security uh, question, which I think is, uh, is very important. Um, you know, as, as we move you know, from a, a, you know, a, a, a high carbon environment to a low carbon environment, um, you know, over a relatively short period of time, it's going to be a massive reinvestment in, in the infrastructure that we require to, uh, to provide us with, you know, with, with energy. And, uh, and for that to happen, for that investment to happen, um, you know, businesses will need um, you know, a, a, a reasonably high degree of policy certainty going forward. Um, you know, people aren't going to invest in, a, in an uncertain environment um, you know, without some sort of certainty that they've got a chance of getting their money back. But businesses take risks, but you know, the risk out there of, um, that many would see at the moment is, is, is a high degree of uncertainty as to um, what's, going to, what's going to happen um, in terms of regulation. And, um, and the other thing, of course, that's necessary to, to drive us towards a, a lower carbon economy is to put a price on carbon so that the investments in the, in the lower carbon environment, um, you know, Become, uh, become easier to justify. And that's very important for energy security going forward, otherwise we could end up with some serious discontinuities. So, so your point is, if a, a price on carbon for an industry will deliver what? It just, 
what, what's the, well, just tease out the business of uncertainty for business. So in other words, if I run a big business, I need a price on carbon because I need to know what the price of my pollution will be so I know what level of investment I put into either a new brown coal power station or, or a solar thermal power station. Is yeah, that or, the case? Or, yeah, or so that you, you know with a reasonable degree of certainty um, you know, what you're investing into. So for a, you know, um, um, without a price on carbon, it's unlikely that you're going to get someone wanting to compete against a brown coal investment. Um, you know, unless there's other ways of incentivising it. Um, and, um, you know, the his history has taught us, I think, that, you know, market-based mechanisms which allow industry to innovate and make, make investment decisions um, is, is, is the right way to actually get the lowest cost outcome as we, as we do inevitably move to a low-cost, uh, a low-carbon environment. I'm sure Roger will come into that later, but there's a gentleman there who's been waiting for a while. Thank you. My name's Gavin Brown, I'm from the Geelong Greens and from Transition East Geelong. I understand the need for compensation for trade exposed industries, although I do feel that it's not well explained and many people may not understand and I think it would be, it's not, it's not my question, I think it would be helpful for an explanation of that tonight. Uh, but my question is really about uh, coal fired power stations. Uh, under the emissions trading scheme that Labor put through or tried to put through before the last election, um, coal fired power stations were uh, given per free permit, so they were compensated. But yet they're not trade exposed. No one's going to imagine that coal-fired power stations are going to send their business overseas and we're going to get electricity from overseas. So my, I have two questions. Uh, why was that the case? And what's the chances of stopping that from happen happening under a carbon tax? Roger? Okay. Why did that happen? Um, uh, essentially, there are two reasons for it. One, uh, there was a belief or a view that shareholders needed to be compensated to recognise for the fact that they hadn't anticipated a carbon price. Now, I'm not going to make any judgments about that. Um, it was a shift in policy. We often compensate shifts in policy. But secondly, there was a concern to ensure that this didn't disrupt the stability of the electricity market, that those businesses were able to stay whole over the medium term in a way that enabled them to continue to provide some proportion of the bedrock power, the base load power. Having said that, we know prices work. Ask any supermarket, ask any service station, ask any businessman who's considering an investment. So we know that in spite of that compensation, you would see a drive in new investments to go to much more carbon uh, friendly uh, modes of production of, of, of power and you'd also see an incentive to clean up those power stations as far as you could and that eventually they would be uh, retired perhaps much more early than they would otherwise have been done. So that's why the, uh, there is some compensation for energy intensive non-trade exposed sectors. That's a matter of judgment about how much that should be, how much is based on equity for shareholders, and how much is based on stability of electrical systems. Gentlemen, sorry, Tim? Sorry, I might just add a brief, there was a question also to explain about um, trade, trade exposed sector, and we saw a great example of that today at the Shell refinery where you know, they're competing directly with petroleum imports from Singapore or from, from India, wherever. Um, and so if, if, if there is, a, pri if there is a, a price imposed on them that makes them uncompetitive, then it, it, they simply lose the competition and, and we'll end up importing fuel and those, you know, the, the refinery will shut down. So th there is a case in trading, so it's a very clear one, I think, for some sort of, uh, some sort of compensation. Right at the back. Gentleman with his hand up. Do you have a microphone yeah, yet? I've got the mic here. Uh, my name's oh. Ryan. I've just got a quick question for Tim. Uh, how much do you profit from all your scaremongering? And, excuse me, and alarmist false predictions? Thank you. Okay. Well, could, could I just Don't ask you, have you heard any, 
any sort of alarmist comments or false predictions this evening or scaremongering this evening? I'm just asking you if you'd heard any this evening, and I don't think so. And what I can say is that we don't need a debate that's driven by scaremongering or rumours or anything else. What we need at the moment in this country is a very clear, level-headed debate that isn't, doesn't use inflammatory language and accuse people of things, but that seeks to get a better level of understanding among, among all Australians, really, on these core issues, because they will affect us one way or the other. Uh, Professor Flannery, uh, Richard Bolas from Carbon Training International. How do you rate the importance of investment in education and training to help reduce carbon emissions moving into the future? Uh, do you foresee a, a stage where every organisation will have a carbon manager, uh, just like uh, today we have uh, OHS managers? Look, well, I'd like to pass that question on to others, particularly Jerry, to have a, to comment on. But could I could I just say that you know w when carbon has a cost, there's going to be someone on the board of every company, I presume, who's going to be responsible for that, and there'll be someone in the account section who will be accounting for it, so it will become embedded, but the, Jerry would know more than there's, me. That there's certainly yeah. trends, Jerry. You might actually go back and look at a bit of the history of development in, even in your industry yeah. in that change. Yeah, and, I, and, and, I, and you know, just, just looking at um, where companies are today, I, I think it's fair to say that the, um, you know, the, the big multinational companies that have you know, operations in, in Europe and, uh, and, um, and, and the US and Australia, for example, you know, they, they were probably in front of the curve, a lot of them, um, just because of their exposure to what was happening in Europe, to thinking about um, you know, the move to a, to a lower carbon economy. Um, you know, BP, for example, has been actively involved in the debate since about 1996. Um, and you know, the, the shells of this world in exactly the, in exactly the same way. Um, in fact, at the Shell Refinery today, we, we met um, you know, one of their uh, one of these exec one of their executives who was uh, responsible for um, for carbon within within Shell Australia. So you know those people do exist in the big companies. They exist in the big um, um, Australian companies. They they may not be titled like that, but um, it's certainly you know, from my experience a big component of um, of um, some uh, some people's jobs, and in fact in some companies many people's jobs. Um, so, so that's the big comes. I, th I think where there is a where there is a potential gap is um, you know as we move to the smaller, medium-sized businesses, um, um, you know what is the level of understanding of you know what the future holds in terms of the move to a lower carbon economy. So, uh, um, I think that's something that we can probably uh, probably help with through our through our process. Can I just get you to follow up? How has Europe responded? I mean. Uh, I mean, it's presented that Australia is at the cutting edge of all of this. Do you want to perhaps put that into, into a context for us? Um, well, I, I think the way that Europe has responded is that they've been prepared to experiment. Um, so they've, they, uh, um, post Kyoto, they had a trading, uh, a, a trading scheme, um, very experimental. Uh, they learnt a lot from it. And so for the, for the next phase of the development of the carbon market in Europe, they'll... Uh, They'll know a lot more about um, how to do it. There's been a tremendous amount of, um, of, of work done in Europe. Um, some of it, you could argue, is, is being very expensive, but they were probably the, 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 the foremost part of the world that's, uh, that's driving a carbon market um, through, a, through a cap and trade system. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot for us to, to, to actually learn from Europe. Um, and, you know, you know you know, we'd be able to provide information over time as to how the rest of the world is actually responding to it. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I think many in this room would be very surprised about how much activity there is going on in the world despite not having, you know, the sort of the, the overarching global agreement. Could I just Tim? point out there too, just to say that the European Emissions Trading Scheme is actually working because there's a lot of misapprehension about that. There was an analysis done last year by the US German Marshall Fund that showed that it was actually driving emissions down towards the target. Mm. So, uh, and they, they look likely to achieve it. So. Gentleman here in the front. Um, I'm Jan van Delfsen, a citizen. Um, talking about the predictability of the cost of fuel in the future um, and a fixed carbon tax on it or carbon price, 
Um, when, when everything's going great and the economy's booming, the price of oil will go up and any alternative will be competitive, uh, particularly if there's a price on carbon, that would make it even more so. But what we've had in the past is then the economy has some sort of collapse and then oil becomes cheaper and then various alternatives go down or bankrupt. Is there some suggestion that those sorts of alternatives should be protected from such downturns in the oil market, for instance? Where would you like to direct that, Tim? Perhaps Roger? Roger. Well, um, let's get this in perspective. Uh, Garno's latest paper suggested that um, for a carbon price of between $20 and $30 a tonne, the impact on the average uh, cost would be somewhere between five and seven cents a litre of standard fuel. That immediately of itself, with two things you could note, first of all, it does provide incentives for alternative, less carbon intensive uh, fuel supplies, but secondly, in the short term at least, it's the equivalent of perhaps uh, $2.50 to $3.50 for on, on a tank of, of fuel, depending on how big your car is. Uh, at least at my service station, it goes up and down by much more than that uh, in the short run. But in the longer run, it's not just price in the automotive sector that matters, it's also design standards. And fuel efficiency design standards and public transport alternatives and progressively urban design are quite critical. Fuels markets, and Jerry is an expert in this, have always been somewhat volatile. We've been through a long period where the real price of fuel has declined. It is likely that as we have to go to more and more unconventional sources for traditional fossil fuels, very deep wells, um, difficult to extract oil shales, that their prices will increase. But alternative fuels have to be able to manage the normal commercial risks above and beyond those, above and beyond the price floor, uh, the relative price, price floor that a carbon price will uh, assist them with. And that's always been so, and I guess always will be so. Jerry, am I being overly academic there? No, no, I think, I, 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 I think, you, I think you are spot on. Um, the, the only other comment I would make is that, um, it, you know, the, the strength of, um, you know, the, in, in supply and demand terms, the strength of the Australian econo economy is irrelevant to um, what, the, what the price of fuel is. It's a global, it's a global um, resource which is determined by supply and demand um, globally. So long term, um, that's what will affect the price of the price of oil. And uh, um, and you know, as as uh, you know, as, as Roger said, the world is going to increasingly difficult places or and difficult technologies to, to extract oil. And, uh, um, you know, over 50% of the reserves in the oil sit in the Middle East, Russia, and, uh, and, uh, and West Africa. So, um, you know, the, 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 there is a real, a real case, I think, that says that um, security supply is going to be more problematic in the future unless we actually diversify uh, and, and start moving to a lower carbon uh, environment as well. The lady here in the red, yeah, etc. Thank you. My name is Lynn. I come from Werribee. Uh, I'm just wondering. Just put the microphone close to your mouth, if you would. If um, isn't it true that the world is suffering a lot from deforestation, and hasn't that contributed a lot to the greenhouse gases in the world? And what is Australia doing to help counteract that? Thanks, Lynn. Um, Uh, the figures that I'm aware of indicate that, I don't know about the global um, figure, but in Australia, deforestation accounts for about 18% of our emissions every year. So, yes, deforestation is an enormous uh, contributor to, to emissions as well as generally to biodiversity loss. Um, 
Roger or some of the others might, might have um, more details about this, but, but one of the ways in which carbon, uh, a carbon price might be a win-win situation for conservation is that um, if it encourages tree planting and encourages restoration of native vegetation, that will sequester carbon as well as provide habitat. So I think it's, an, it's a really good example of a potential win-win and opportunity for environmental conservation um, using carbon pricing as a mechanism. So can, I, can I add to yeah. what Leslie has said? Um, and uh, that is this. Australia is important, uh, uh, and, and more particularly land clearing has been important to Australia as a source of emissions. We have done quite a lot over the last 20 years to reduce that. But where we have to act globally is to reduce deforestation in the great tropical uh, rainforests. And, and at the moment, that is one area where at the global level we can see progress, slow and stuttering, but definitely happening in the international negotiations. Because if we can turn round and slow the extent of clearance of uh, forests in the Amazon, in Indonesia, in the Congo, um, we can indeed, at a very low overall cost and at a high biodiversity gain, reduce a significant proportion of global greenhouse gases. Uh, we have to do it reliably though, we have to make sure that it's real, and we have to make sure that the people who live in and who have been trying to extract resources from those forests get proper compensation for it through the international community. And I'm, I'm positive that this has begun to move forward in quite a, a, a real way in the world and satellite, remote satellite imaging uh, and carbon accounting uh, is really providing a tool that will enable us to say this is real, this can be paid for and then the tricky question is how do we make sure that the villagers, the people who otherwise have this incentive to clear, uh, get some benefit from that themselves so that the rest of the world's not just imposing it on them. But I'm, I'm quite positive about that and having multiple payoffs. We might have a, um, given that Australia's emissions reduction target is 5% guaranteed by 2020, I might just, from the commissioners, think how might, how might we uh, most quickly achieve that? You might bear that in mind. There's a gentleman there with a blue shirt on that's been waiting for a while. Yes, uh, John Lambert, I've been involved in energy conservation and renewables for 35 years um, and what I'm about to say is that I should be, shouldn't be wasting my time in that field. It seems to me in Australia our problem is we've adopted the American approach to urban in infrastructure with very low population densities of about 1,200 people per square kilometre. The Europeans have high density infrastructure with four and a half thousand people per square kilometres or more. Um, it was fine for us to each have our individual house with an individual family and an individual block of land uh, in an empty country, but the price we're paying is in energy uh, conservation, I mean consumption, and it also creates the problem that public transport port will never work because it's not dense enough. There's nothing I've heard uh, that is tending to make governments in any area uh, change that mode of infrastructure building. We've got Armstrong Creek here. It's being built entirely along the same lines, very energy wasteful in its infrastructure. We've got the proposed in Melbourne for 70,000 people, exactly the same. I don't see that a carbon tax will have question? impact on all. What I ask the Commission is, have they got any ideas about how we could stop building the infrastructure we've had for decades and, and turn it around and go, go for more energy efficient infrastructure? If, if I can respond to that again. <laughs> I think you're, 
you're right. Uh, it's not a moral problem that we were like that. Uh, it's about a question of timing and growth. All of, the, all of the nations that have grown rapidly since the car was invented uh, have tended to, to go to a, a more decentralised uh, pattern. Um, however, what you can see happening is that densification is occurring even within Australia. We have to provide incentives and constraints and assistance to develop denser corridors and nodes around that enable public transport and that provide that choice. Um, this is what I meant earlier when I said it's never going to be just a carbon price. In the long run, it's about many complementary measures, including planning measures associated with the urban shape. Now, having said that, we have got what we have got. You know, the fact is that we do have large decentralised cities, so it's a question of building back from that and it will happen relatively uh, slowly because we only add an increment of about 3% per annum to the housing uh, stock. Rob, Rob sorry, yes, could I just ask that we might turn to some of the questions that people were kind enough to send earlier on? Because Absolutely. I'm sure there's people waiting for their question to be read out. Okay. So. There's, there's one that said, I think, I think this is in your space, Tim. Um, if the current climate change event turns out to be a natural event, that is not caused by human-induced induced carbon cycle changes, then what's the view of the Climate Commission on a, attempting to modify or control the climate change event? A bit of, uh, bit of climatic engineering, is that a possibility? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think what that question is saying is that if this is a natural event, so if it's not um, caused by, by humans, and that's one thing that the, the climate scientists are very, very clear on and very certain on, and will can perhaps talk to that, um, what, what is the possibility of trying to control it? Is that, that yeah, was the well, point of the question. Can we manage, I mean, we, you know, if we accept the climate science, we've in a sense managed the climate. Yeah, if, it, yeah. if it turns out to be a natural event, can we manage it another way? Look, let's, let's park the natural event off to the side and, and Will can talk to whether, whether it's a natural event or not. But, but could I just say, what I think what the question's getting at there is sort of geoengineering, really, whether, whether we could use other technologies. And um, this, this is a very much a live debate in some areas. I'm, I sit on the board of a group at, at Oxford University that, that is trying to get a clearer understanding around um, what the geoengineering options are and how... Um, what, what sort of constraints are required, really, before um, we, we, we move to consider those options? Because, you know, at that point, we're dealing with fairly drastic interventions with the planetary system, and we're, we're, we're in a position at the moment where we've got a very immature political uh, and even public dialogue around those, those issues. But, so, difficult, complex stuff way out there, and I don't think we need to, we're not going to be worrying about it this year or next year, but 20, 30 years from now, this might be a much more live debate. But will Tim, perhaps I will. Just add very, very quickly, um, the scientific community is more than 90% sure that what we're seeing is not a natural swing in climate. As I mentioned earlier, it is due to the additional greenhouse gases that uh, industrial activities primarily and some deforestation is put up into the atmosphere. That's about as close to a consensus uh, that you'll ever get uh, in the scientific community. There's basically no doubt in the scientific community about it. Second point, just to complement what Tim said, is the whole... Uh, aim of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by whatever economic instruments and other regulatory measures you take, whatever, whatever you decide is the best, is to actually take that pressure back off the natural climate system that we're putting on through the additional greenhouse gases so that we in fact don't have to manage the climate. We let nature manage the climate as it, as it always has. So there's a big philosophical and ethical difference and scientific difference between letting emissions go and then trying to manage the climate somehow, as Tim said, or taking the pressure back off the climate, which is what the current uh, debate is about in terms of ab uh, emission abatement. Um, Will, where are we heading right now? Leslie said we're getting close to one. What are the... Yeah, okay. We're, we're sitting at about 0.8 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level now. Um, that's a global average. There is a lot of momentum in the system, mainly stored in the ocean. If we could cut emissions to zero tomorrow, which we can't, and let the climate slowly come to equilibrium, we'll get about another four-tenths of a degree. So we're sitting at about 1.2 guaranteed. 
Uh, we think, as we said earlier, that anything above two degrees uh, will put us in some reasonably dangerous territory, and some scientists argue that 1.5 is a better number. Uh, this puts a real sense of urgency on getting these emissions down. If we don't, if we can continue on the, the, the trajectory we're on now, um, a good bet is somewhere around four degrees late this century with a range of a best case of maybe two and a half and a worst case of around six above pre-industrial. Uh, four degrees is pretty frightening from those of us who understand what the impacts of... Well, well what happens at plus four? What, what, what does the science tell us is happening at plus four? Well, you're going to get... Uh, uh, massive heat waves. Let's just give you an example. Uh, the heat wave that we had in Melbourne uh, in, in February 2009, which was, uh, this was a mega event. It was over three degrees above the previous high temperature. That's unheard of when you look at climate records. Uh, heat wave in, in Russia, uh, heat wave in Europe in 2003. If we keep going toward a four degree world, um, by the middle of the century, that will be an everyday summer event. <laughs> At four degrees, average temperature rise, say by 2080, that event in Melbourne will be a cool summer day. All right? This is what it means in terms of how extremes change. They change far more than averages. Uh, and that, to give you another uh, indicator, when we swing from an ice age um, to a warm period, these big swings where in an ice age, most of the northern hemisphere and much of it is under ice, that temperature swing is about five degrees in average temperature. So we're headed for very close to the same magnitude of temperature change as between an ice age and a warm period. Don't be fooled by what we think, well, going from 24 to 28, that's not a big, big change. It's a huge change in terms of how the climate system operates. Those are some of the indicators we can look at. Yeah, I was going to say, how are ecosystems responding at plus four, Leslie? At, at plus four, I don't even like to think about plus four. No, it's too know. scary. Um, let me just give you the example of the Great Barrier Reef, and most of you will have heard of, of the, the problem that the reef has on a, in a hot summer, it bleaches. Um, since 1979, the, the reef's had a, between about seven and ten bleaching events, depending on how you define a bleaching event, and we don't know of any bleaching events before 1979. Now, a bleaching event occurs when the sea surface temperature gets about a degree above the long-term uh, maximum summer temperature. So um, you only need a degree for part of the reef to bleach and die. Um, as I said, we've had between seven and ten major bleaching events. The worst were in 1998 and 2002, which were particularly hot years. If we keep on the trajectory that we're going on now, even before we get, way before we get to four degrees, the, reach will, the, the reef will bleach every single year. Um, by about 2030. So that means there's no time in between events for the reef to recover and the coral reef will turn into an algal bed, which is, it'll have a bit of biodiversity there, but you probably wouldn't want to go and snorkel in it. So um, four degrees um, from a biological point of view, frankly, it's too scary to even think about. Here's a very local one. We've talked around this, but this is a very specific one. Where are Alcoa workers going to get jobs when the Point Henry smelter is shut down because it cannot compete with exports from China and elsewhere where no carbon tax applies? Okay, I think Roger. Okay. Uh, going back to what I said at the beginning of this process, uh, the Grattan Institute... Ooh. Everything okay? Ready. Can we continue? Can someone let me know that it's okay for us to proceed? I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Continue, Roger. I'm sorry, I've lost... Um, uh, it was about <laughs> the, the <Alcoa laughs> jobs at Alcoa, the Alcoa smelter. And, um, uh, and competition from China without an ETS. Well, look, among my sins, I'm uh, uh, a member of the uh, policy committee of the Grattan Institute in uh, the University of Melbourne, very independent institute, as I said earlier. Uh, they've done a major review of the... Um, uh, the 
impact of a carbon price on a number of highly energy intensive sectors. Uh, one of those plants that they looked at was Point Henry. Point Henry is in fact a very economically efficient producer on a global scale and providing it gets some EI to have some assistance uh, from government by the way of free permits or rebates, its future looks quite robust. So I think there's a really big, uh, and, and every scheme that I've ever seen has had that built into it, including many of the international schemes. So I'm not sure that the premise of the scheme that workers at Alcoa will lose their jobs because of climate change is right. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's extremely unlikely on any politically plausible scheme or economically plausible scheme that I could see being introduced. Now, those are just observations. We don't make policy advice or recommendations to government. And, and on the point of uh, China without a carbon tax? Well, well China, first of all, I, this is terrible name dropping, but I, I'm also on Wen Ji Bao's uh, advisory committee on environment and development, and we meet with him once a year. China is actually moving quite hard to reduce emissions and the emissions intensity of its population. Yes, absolute emissions in China will grow as the income of its people will increase but they're still fractionally, on a per capita basis, what our emissions are. The Chinese aluminium industry uh, effectively balances its imports. China is not a huge net exporter, and they are progressively moving to move away from highly energy intensive export focused sectors because they realised realized how much that exposes them and their economy, not just to, to uh, greenhouse and domestic pollution, but also to global economic turmoil. And it's been really reinforced by the GFC. Here's a question from Vera Lubchenko, and she asks, apart from introducing a carbon tax, how will the government get the required behaviour change to get people consuming less and living more sustainably? Look, I, I really think that that is only going to come with, with increased public awareness of, of what's at stake. And as we've heard um, from Will and Leslie, some of the things are at stake if, if we don't act on these issues. And also a bit more of a sense of, of responsibility for, for the future. We can often be really short term, but I mean, I don't want to be trite about it, but it is, it is events like this that start to bed down the sort of, the sort of change that we need. And they're not going to happen quickly. It's going, to, you know, it's going to take us quite a while, I think, to change some of the, the things we do that are, that are unsustainable. But um, it's, it's down to individuals. It really is. It's funny, one of my great scientific heroes, a man called Bill Hamilton, who was interested in what evolution had produced, uh, said, he, just before he died, he was investigating a project which was about the stability of ecosystems. And he, he said something like, you know, I'm really interested in when the next Genghis Khan species is going to arise and destroy the planet. And there's a sort of a theoretical interest you can have through mathematical modelling and so forth and through looking at ecosystems and the way they work. But as I read that paper, I started thinking, you know, we don't need to look very far to find out about the next Genghis Khan species. We need to just ask ourselves what we're doing, perhaps. Mm. And um, it's, it's, a, it's the great question. There's a question here, I'm just going to paraphrase it a little, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's quite appropriate to ask it now. And it's a, it's a bit about, you know, where have you scientists been recently? Uh, the question is, how's the ordinary person to know which information to believe? And I think we might have answered that. But why does there appear to be no public debate between the IPCC experts and the alternative sceptic view? I think this falls to Leslie and Will. Yeah, I'll have a first go at that. Um, the reason there isn't is because there actually isn't a debate um, in the scientific community. Uh, and uh, let me, 
But, but the questioner can, can certainly uh, be excused for uh, believing there is a debate, uh, because what you see in the public over the past year or so has diverged radically from what goes on in the scientific community. Uh, the scientific community debates things through uh, peer-reviewed literature, evidence-based, how well can you observe things, explain the observations, how well does it agree with theory, and we debate this quite vigorously. And there's some aspects of climate change which we are still debating. Tropical cyclones, for example, how rainfall patterns will change. There's a lot of uncertainties around that. But the key point is, is the climate shifting? Is it getting warmer? Unequivocal is the word that we use. What's the cause for that? The emission of greenhouse gases from human activities. In the scientific literature, there is no debate about those topics. What you see out in, in the media and in the press is what a lot of my colleagues call a phony or false debate. Uh, and the reason you're, you're not seeing many of them out there is quite honestly they are frustrated uh, and really annoyed uh, by the way the media has treated them. Uh, and so they're going back to the bench, going back to their ships, going back out to the field sites to do their research, which is what they're paid for. They're not paid for standing up in front of the media against someone who is uh, not an expert uh, and having to go through that sort of experience. So, so basically, on the fundamental science of climate change, there is no debate. There hasn't been for a couple of decades. Uh, and if you really want to test my statement about that, then you go into the peer-reviewed literature and see if you can find a debate, a debate and you can't. Thank you, Will. Well, can I just... Um, I, I just wanted to add to that, I mean, yes, it's, it's true, as Will says, there's lots of climate scientists that are getting pretty sick of it and, and have retreated back into their burrows to look at their test tubes and a, a few foolish ones like Will and I, That's right, um, <laughs> you know, we're here. Um, climate scientists are a really funny bunch. They're the only scientists that wake up every morning and, and hope that they're wrong. Um, because if they're wrong, um, we'll all be okay. Um, it's just that if we're right, um, we potentially won't be okay. Um, there are quite a lot of surveys all the time, not just about what the public thinks about climate change, but about what scientists think. The last one that I read that, that, that involved a lot of scientists was a, a study done a couple of years ago by the, the Pew Institute in the US, um, and they uh, surveyed uh, publishing scientists, so people who are actively doing research, and they got um, consensus of 98% of those scientists in terms of the climate changing and what is the probable cause. And so I would ask those of you that are out there that, that, are, that are still a bit um, in the sceptical camp about this, if, if you turned up at the airport and you're about to get on a plane and 98% out of 100, Qantas engineers said, well, I think there's a 90% chance that this plane will crash. You know, would you get on it? Um, and then even if you were going to get on it and take the risk, because the, the two that, you know, looked pretty, pretty confident that it wasn't going to crash, would you take your family with you? And that's really what we're talking about. Can I ask, let me just get through Talk some questions. This, th this question is the corollary of the one we asked about Alcoa and loss of jobs. And this might go to you, Jerry, and it's really on the opportunistic side. It says, how will a carbon tax and ETS assist Geelong transition to a low carbon economy? And what influence will this have on new industries and employment opportunities in Geelong? So what, where's the future? Um, well, carbon, a carbon tax or emissions trading scheme, a price on carbon, whatever we call it, will, will, will have two impacts. N number, number one, it will, um, you know, it will provide an additional incentive for people to become... Um, you know, less energy intensive uh, in, in terms of uh, the amount of energy they use. Um, and then the other part of it, of course, it will provide an incentive for investments. Um, what, um, you know, we, we've already talked through the, the trade exposed industries here, you know, um, you know prima facie, um, you know, um, providing they get through the transition period, then they're competing on the international stage and they, they stand on their own two feet, um, as they do today. The, um, the you know, other energy opportunities. I think that's um, you know I think that's really for the you know the, the grassroots um, and the, the entrepreneurs and the businesses that are involved in Geelong to, to, to get you know to get involved. BP, in. BP became beyond petroleum, got into solar. Was that a successful venture? Um, in 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 many ways, it was a tremendous learning experience. Um, we never um, we never made a lot of money out of solar. 
Um, but we did learn a lot about the, you know, the development of technology in the renewables space. We're also, uh, you know, and I say we with BP, I still got the habit, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, B BP is one of the biggest solar um, solar power providers in the in the US, um, and is hugely into biofuels in um, in Brazil, where we believe that you know there, there are. Uh, um, sustainable ways in which you can actually grow sugar cane and, and process it, not, not only through first generation, which is the way that we, we do it today, producing ethanol, but second generation, which is actually going to be uh, even more environmentally sustainable and low energy. So, you know, th those are the sort of things that when people see opportunities, when you actually um, take a view as to what the carbon, you know, w you know, what the cost of carbon is going to be in the future, and that's facilitated by, um, you know, government uh, regulation or, you know, or, or moving into, a, into an ETS or a carbon tax uh, or a carbon price, um, you know, once those things are in place, then that increases the confidence and will increase the investment. But at the moment, I have to say, um, whilst there's uncertainty as to what the policy settings are going to be, then you know, it's, it's difficult to see businesses investing with the same degree of confidence. Tim? Rob, could I just say we're, we're on to the last few yeah. minutes and I'd love to ha just have a couple more questions from the audience. If anyone's sure. got a burning short one, put your hand up, we'll deal with it properly and I'll wrap up and get us finished by gentleman way at the back there with his hand up high and uh, I'm just trying to pick people. This gentleman here on my left had, a, had his hand up for a while. Oh, this gentleman here already has the microphone too. So could you ask your yes. question please? Then the gentleman at the back, then this one here. My name's Philip Yuba again. I'm a representative of a company called the Carbon Farm. Uh, the question's for Professor Flannery. Um, from what I find, uh, Geelong is part of a rural area and uh, the ETS is, uh, and the carbon tax we know is, you know, is a means of, um, of taxing the mining company. There's a huge opportunity with agriculture. Uh, in the last 27 years, uh, that's what I've been dealing with, this carbon and measuring it, uh, peer review program, uh, through uh, the NADA accreditation system. And last year we had farmers um, that grew 10,000 acres of, 10,000 hectares rather of wheat, uh, produced 800,000 tonnes. And, uh, you know, no one at Climate Change wanted to talk about it. And if you want to talk about price, I mean, they would, they'd take $2.50, $3.50 today if you have a question. Yeah, the question is, will you listen as a commission um, the, to, to the opportunities and, and re-look at agriculture because a, as a climate sink, it's bigger than the oceans if you take in the um, uh, 300 to 1 ratio with uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission um, equivalent. I think I've got it. Who wants to have a go at that? So it's, it it's was part of the national debate, so it's carbon, say, yeah. carbon in agriculture. Look, just very, very briefly, we as a commission haven't turned our mind particularly to that area yet. I think as time goes on, we will have a look, particularly at the carbon farming initiative and so forth. Good. And, and I, I agree with you, the potential there for, for, for storing carbon in the soil through a number of different technologies and in trees is very substantial. The gentleman here has a microphone, and if we could take that microphone to the gentleman at the back. Uh, my name is Gordon Alderson, uh, citizen of Geelong. Um, my question perhaps is to Professor Stefan, firstly. My understanding of the science is that we need to be very careful to differentiate between correlation and causation when it comes to carbon dioxide. Because as I understand it, as the, as the oceans heat up, they give off carbon dioxide. And so my summation of that is that it's the heating that causes the carbon dioxide, not the carbon dioxide that causes the heating. And further to that, uh, just looking at the numbers, uh, I understand that if in uh, about 86,000 molecules of air, uh, about 32 of those are carbon dioxide molecules, and just one of those, 32, is, has been caused by human ac activity. So my question is, with one molecule in 86,000 molecules of air, how can that one molecule a, be identified as one that's coming from human yeah. sources. I think and secondly, how can it be blamed for, for heating when yeah, it's yeah. the other way around? Okay, no, look, um, 
the, the interaction between ocean temperature and CO2 is what we call a feedback. It's part of a system process. Uh, as oceans warm, they give out more CO2, but as there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, it warms the Earth's surface and the ocean zone uh, warm more and so on. This is the major feedback loop, one of the two major feedback loops that drives the Earth from an ice age to a warm period. So it isn't either or, it's a feedback loop. Uh, we know the physical properties of CO2 very well. They do warm the planet. We know the solubility of CO2 in ocean water. It's more soluble in cold water. So you're partly right. But the other part of the equation is CO2 does warm the surface of the planet. Second thing, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, just, first of all, just a, a slight correction there. Um, the pre-industrial uh, concentration was 280 parts per million. Now it's approaching 390, so it's far more than what you say. But nevertheless, compared to all the other gases, it's very small. So let me address that, that second part of the question. The, po the important, anal important analogies here are, depending on the nature of a substance, very small quantities have a very big impact. Look at the nuclei, a radioactive nuclear material being emitted by the Japanese reactors. That's much, much lower in concentration than CO2. And yet, if you could just and, yet, and, yet, and yet it has a very large effect. So what I'm saying is that don't compare a percentage of CO2 compared to nitrogen gas, which is inert. The point is how many billions of tons of CO2 are in the atmosphere? What are the properties of that CO2? How much radiation does it absorb? And how much radiation does it re-emit? Re Those are all quantitative numbers that we know very well. It's all basic physics. And we know that the amount of CO2, the additional CO2 that we've put in, should raise the Earth's temperature by about 1.2 or 1.3 degrees at equilibrium. And it's exactly where we're tracking. So all the physics adds up. Uh, and it doesn't matter what sort of percentages or molecule per molecule you say. We know how many billions of tons are there. We know its properties. We know what it does, and that's exactly what we're observing. Now, I've already eaten up. <laughs> I've already eaten up uh, more than 50% of Tim's wrap-up time. I'm going to leave you about two and a half. I, I'm sorry, sir, you've had your go. Can your question be very quick? No, can it be very quick? Go. Okay. It's, um, we've, we've had so much uh, about... Um, Energy. I'm, I'm happy with it, and thank you for the panel. Graham Lorimer, retired en uh, civil engineer. Um, very happy to have this debate. See the need for CO uh, for carbon reduction. My problem is there seems to be a, a silence from government and from all the people that say we have nuclear or not nuclear. It seems to be the horns of a dilemma. Uh, we don't hear much about the thermal geothermal uh, energy now, um, Tim. Uh, has in his book in 2005 in South Australia was very in excited that the drilling down there was showing possibilities of, of a great breakthrough. In 2008 we were told in the advertiser great possibilities. A month later one of the scientists of Melbourne said sorry it's going to be five or ten years with the backing of government and so on. Why is government so silent um, on the possibility of probably the safest, cleanest, load-bearing power source in geothermal energy. The drilling is now done. We know we can drill five to ten miles down, but we don't know the geology. The, to wrap up. the geology needs looking at. How, much, how can we encourage the government, Tim, to do more to promote uh, exploratory work, research on, on underground geology and the water transmission under the earth? in safe areas like Australia. Thank you. Look, I, I, I did promise to get everyone home in time for the game and end up promptly at 7 o'clock. I'm going to do my very best to do that. Um, could I just say geothermal energy still has great promise. <laughs> it's slow developing, um, and there's a number of reasons for that. You know, all new technologies take a, a, a certain amount of time to develop and come to scale. It does concern me, however, that well, not just Australia, but many countries lack sort of medium-term um, energy strategies. You know, where we've got some very good uh, programs in place, like the mandated renewable energy target and so forth, which have been very good for wind and, and photovoltaics, which are, you know, quite mature. But we haven't been quite so good at developing some of those other energy sources, which I think will be very important in future, like concentrated PV, for example, or geothermal. And uh, it's, it's, it's proved more difficult to do that, but it is something I think we desperately need to do. Um, 
Could I just, in wrapping up, thank you all for being here. This has been a tremendous learning experience, I think, for me, for my fellow commissioners, and hopefully uh, for you as well. It's been a really great engagement, and I do thank you for your fantastic questions, the breadth of questions, the honesty with which you've, you've asked them. And um, I'd just like to wish you all the very best for the future and hope that this doesn't end your engagement with climate issues. There's a website which is under development for the Commission. We're hoping that we can stay in touch with the people we meet through our various uh, uh, meetings around the country. So if you're online, please check the website and uh, look to us for updates and we'll try to get messages out to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Can I... Thank you for that. Can I remind you all to complete your feedback forms and hand them back to the registration desk. It's very important that you do. Uh, your other questions will be answered on the website, so if you answered, asked a question that hasn't been answered, look for an answer there. And if you still have a question to submit, put it on the website and it will be answered. Thank you all for your time. We hope it's been valuable for you. Thank you for your questions. And please thank our Commission once again for being here this evening. Good evening. The Geelong Students Environmental Network. I'll ask them to stand up and reveal themselves to you. And their spokesperson, Tycho Wharton from Cadenia College, will say a few words. Welcome, Tycho. The Geelong Students Environment Network is a student network promoting collaboration on the topic of the environment and sustainability between different schools in Geelong. To date, we have we have pr promoted collaboration between schools and shared ideas from the installation of solar panels to implementing better recycling systems, as well as how positive interaction between schools can lead to the community as a whole making a positive change. We're very grateful to have the opportunity today to represent the opinions of many students. We believe that it is important for these discussions to be had with all members of the community and should be promoted to a greater extent within schools. Young people have an important perspective that should be taken into consideration when forming a policy that will define our future. As a group, we believe that it is vital that action be taken on the issue of climate change. Thus, we are very pleased that the government is taking the step of starting this discussion of engaging with communities to develop the best possible solutions. We understand that this is a difficult debate. There will be many hard choices, many different viewpoints. But I'd just like you to know that we as young people are doing everything we can through all available channels to look for solutions. However, action from our leaders and communities is needed to secure a safe future for our climate. We hope we have shown you that young people have an important opinion on this issue. And this is not simply about numbers, models and impact statements. This is about our future. We can act in facilitate this evening's discussions. <laughs> a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will be recorded. Uh, for live broadcast and publicly available on the website. I think that's a very good thing to do. So if you would prefer not to be digitally recorded or photographed, there's an area that you should move to, and I believe that uh, you've been asked about that as you came in. I uh, just want to remind people about that. Also, if you have a question to ask, you will be asked to sign a release form so that we can continue to use your image. So just be aware of that as well. Now, because the Commission values your feedback, there are certainly some feedback forms on your seats. And it's very important that you fill these in and uh, pass these back at the conclusion of the event. Exits, there's the exit that you came in from. Uh, there's another exit hidden behind over here and some more on the south side of the building. Uh, in a case of an emergency, you'll be directed to one of those exits. Toilets are at the back of the room. And may I ask you, please, to make sure that your mobile phone won't ring 
I understand how precious they are to you, so at least have it on vibrate or whatever is your preference, but please don't let it ring in, in fairness to the question, uh, to questions being asked by our commissioners. The aim of this evening is to begin a conversation. I think that's a legitimate word to use. The Commission is here to listen as well as to share its knowledge and experiences. We'll hear from each Commissioner on what they've heard from people in Geelong. They've been out and about today. We'll also hear from some of the Geelong community on their climate change concerns. We have had a large number of questions submitted as you registered for uh, and we'll here put those into two categories. Certainly we'll look at climate uh, science but also look at carbon pricing as a key issue as well. But initially, Commissioner Flannery has asked that we do that. I do request though that your questions be focused and as brief as possible so that we can have an opportunity for as many people as possible to participate actively. So if you're making statements, I'm afraid I will cut you off and I'll take them as comments or statements. So policy and I value my independence in that area and my distance from politics um, uh, greatly and I want to carry that into the Commission's role. And I think it's very important that we remain independent. Otherwise, why would people listen to us? We could just be giving you political spin and that I'm determined not to do. We really want to foster a, a deeper community discussion about climate science, about the international environment that, that Australia is uh, acting uh, in, and on the options, the economic options that are before us uh, as a nation. It's a genuine two-way dialogue. Um, this morning we were at the Shell refinery here in Geelong and it was a fantastic experience for me to see that extraordinary thing down there. It's an amazing industrial complex. Uh, and to hear firsthand um, from uh, workers down there about their concerns uh, and about the structure and nature of their business. Over lunch today, we had a fantastic community lunch. Your federal representative uh, for North Geelong turned up along with um, a number of state representatives and three mayors from the district and business leaders. We had, a, a, I think, a really constructive and, and deep engagement over that lunch. And so we come somewhat armed this evening with a sense of the, challenge, the challenges and opportunities that present themselves uh, in this region. I'm going to be very, very brief because I really want to hear from you. Um, just to reassure you that we'll get you home by 7.30, by the time that the Cats game uh, is due to start. So don't worry about that. Don't panic and run out at the end. Um, we're going to stick to our schedule. Um, once again, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to, uh, to a very lively couple of hours. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We now have for you, just to begin proceedings, three brief presentations from members of the, Geel of the Geelong community. First, we have with us students from the move on to legitimate questions. is conducted politely and with a high level of mutual respect. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Professor Tim Flannery as the Chief Climate Commissioner, uh, of course, I've mentioned already he's one of the writers on climate change, an internationally acclaimed scientist. He works around the world. Uh, explorer, conservationist, and named Australian of the Year in 2007. He's held various academic positions, including Professor at the University of Adelaide, Director of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, Principal Research Scientist at the Australian Museum, and Visiting Chair in Australian Studies at Harvard University in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. Please welcome Tim, Fl Tim Flannery. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you all for coming out on this rather chilly Geelong evening. Uh, I must admit that with the Cats game on in Melbourne, I thought we might be looking at uh, two people and a dog or something like that, so I'm very, very pleased to see such a large group of people interested in this subject. I just want to br briefly explain to you about the Commission's role and our intent being here tonight. This is our first event, and we came to Geelong, we wanted to come to Geelong specifically because we felt that in areas like this, it, the cl climate change and the community and government response to the issue are critically important to your futures. You have many industries down here that are trade exposed, that are carbon intensive. You're also in an area that's being affected by climate change. 
So it's important that we as an Australian, as a nation, get the response to climate change right, particularly for places like Geelong. The Commission is an independent body. Um, we don't take um, advice, we don't uh, uh, take direction from the Minister or from the Government. And I value our, com our, our independence um, particularly, as do all of the Commissioners. Um, I've criticised um, John Howard and Kevin Rudd on climate Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first of a series of national held with Australia's new Climate Commission. May we uh, welcome the commissioners and I'll briefly introduce them to you. From your left, Chief Commissioner, internationally acclaimed scientist, writer, conservationist and former Australian of the Year, Professor Tim Flannery. Uh, thank you. Adjacent to Tim. Mr. Jerry Houston, recently retired president of BP Australia. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Professor Leslie Hughes, head of the Department of Biological Sciences at Macquarie University. <laughs> Professor Will Steffen, executive director of the Australian National University Climate Change Institute. And Mr. Roger Beale, Executive Director of Economics and Policy at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Flannery will introduce the Commissioners more a little later. I'd also like to acknowledge that our forum is being held on the traditional lands of the Wadawurrung people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I'd also like to pay, pay my respects to their elders, past and present, present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. You're welcome to do that too. For those who don't know me or think that my only task in my life has ever been to do the weather on the telly, my name is Rob Gell. I'm an environmentalist and earth scientist, a practicing environmental communications consultant. I'm also the National President of Greening Australia, member of the Victorian Coastal Council. I chair a UNESCO biosphere on the other side of Port Phillip Bay, and I'm a member of, Victoria's, of the Victorian Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability's Reference Group, so I hope I'll be able to faithfully 